When you think of a bullet hell, a couple things probably come to mind. Dodging through waves of bullets, maybe roguelikes, and probably a couple specific titles like Enter the Gungeon, Fury, or Cuphead. But what do you think of when you hear reverse bullet hell? If you said you have no idea, a few months ago I'd have been right there with you. The genre as a whole is actually pretty new, only really being coined from what I can tell with the meteoric rise of vampire survivors. But games like Barbarian have existed for years, so what exactly is a reverse bullet hell? Hey everybody, Alaskan Beard here, and today I want to talk about reverse bullet hells. Vampire Survivors has a somewhat shallow gameplay loop, and despite that I've put 40 hours into it, and that's without playing the newly released DLC. That's a pretty good value proposition given the original $2.99 price tag. So that got me wondering, there's gotta be more games in the genre, right? Well, before we can talk about them, we need to figure out what a reverse bullet hell, RBH for short, actually is. But before we can even do that, we need to talk about a little bit of history of the genre. It's very brief, as there were only two games that are truly in the RBH genre before 2022. Though there are games like the aforementioned Bardbarian that released all the way back in 2014, these are more forefathers, ancestors, than they are truly in the same genre. For that, we need to look at Magic Survival and Vampire Survivors, the pioneers of the genre. With Magic Survival being released a month before VS in February of 2021, but things didn't really take off until December of 2021 when VS released to Steam Early Access. After which it only took a few months for clones to start coming out, with the first one being released as early as April of 2022. Now that we've gone over the history, how do we define the genre? I think it's pretty fair to base most of our criteria off of MS and VS, given that they were the original two RBHs, so what gameplay elements are central to each? The first element is automatic shooting. Aiming I think is okay, but you shouldn't have to pull the trigger. At that point, it's just a top-down shooter, and even having to aim can be a bit troublesome because it can get into twin-stick shooter territory pretty quickly, but I think if all the other criteria is met, it's fine. The second element is having multiple weapons. I don't want to be too strict with this requirement because it would eliminate some games that I've already tried, but all games should have multiple weapons in some way, shape, or form. The third, weapon leveling. There needs to be a way for your weapons to get stronger. I debated making weapon evolutions a requirement, but I feel like that also excludes too many games from the genre. However, I do think games that implement weapon evolutions tend to be better, at least in my experience so far. The fourth, the roguelike elements. There needs to be randomness, which usually comes in the form of leveling for these games, and there also needs to be an overall progression system outside of each run. These are staples of the roguelike genre, and they need to be here as well, I think. And the last element, the perspective. It needs to be top-down or isometric, otherwise we get really close to other genres like maybe an on-rails shooter. I think all these genre staples leave enough room for games to form their own niche, but making it so every game that you play that's on this list or defined with this list feels familiar, you know, kind of feels similar at the very least to the other games. Now that we've gotten our groundwork done, let's actually talk about some games. I started with a list of almost 50 games that I compiled mostly from various If You Like Vampire Survivors Try X articles, and ended up with 18 that I think fit the genre. This episode would be way too long if I talked about them all in one video, so let's split it down the middle and talk about the 9 best ones for now. Bringing up the rear at number 9 is Further Still Survivors. The game may not be the best looking, but it's definitely competent gameplay wise. It's what I call a bandwagon release, where it pulls the bulk of its elements pretty much straight from Vampire Survivors, but I think there's room for both to exist on Steam. The main thing further still adds on top of VS's gameplay is story. It's definitely simplistic, but just having something to tie all of your runs together, a reason to get reincarnated, and interacting with NPCs for your upgrades instead of just using a menu, they all add some depth to the replayability and it may not be implemented as well as Hades' is, but it does feel very similar to how Hades does their in-between run sections. The other noteworthy element is progression. It has similar systems to almost every other game on this list, but it probably feels the best. I felt like each upgrade I was able to buy made a noticeable difference every run, and the rate that you unlock different options is slow and steady, making it so you can buy one or two new things after each run. I'm not really sure if they got lucky or if they did a lot of playtesting, but it really feels dialed in. There are definitely other games you should play before this one, but I think it'll be worth it 
after it leaves early access, and if you've exhausted everything else on this list, it's worth trying out. Next up at number 8 is Her Name Was Fire. This game almost didn't make the cut because of the way you attack, but I think it's worth including even if it's with an asterisk, because it executes everything else so well. The attacking is obviously the main standout, with it playing a lot like a twin stick shooter where you aim in a direction and then when your meter fills you shoot, slash, or whatever your primary attack is. It's definitely different from most other RBHs, but by my own criteria, it's still auto-firing, so it ever so slightly squeaks by. The game does have some other unique elements. The stage progression is objective-based rather than purely surviving for a time limit. After playing for a while, a server will spawn. After killing a certain number of servers, the final boss for the stage spawns, and after beating it, you get to start a new level, obviously with higher difficulty. This server mechanic adds a decent amount of depth to the game because it forces you to stay in one area, kind of like capturing a flag almost. Keeping you tethered like that leads to some pretty frenetic moments and serves as a good change of pace from the core gameplay. Beyond that, it's worth mentioning that this game is gorgeous. It's simplistic for sure, but the background detail, enemies, and especially the animations all look fantastic. This one's not an early access, so I wouldn't count on getting more updates to make it better, but I think it's different enough to stand on its own next to the other games on this list. At number 7 is probably the weirdest game on this list, at least looks-wise. It's Brotato. This game probably strays the furthest away from VS as far as the RBH genre goes, and it does a lot of things I like. You actually have two leveling systems rather than one. The first is traditional levels that give you stat increases like health, defense, attack, etc. The second is collecting currency each round and spending them in the post round shop to buy weapons and passives. They do something interesting with the weapons too. Rather than leveling them up directly, like spending currency to get a level, you actually have to buy same tiered weapons or create same tiered weapons by buying lower tiers and then combining them. It's kind of similar to a lot of the mobile games where you have to like have two heroes of one type and then combine them to make a new one um but obviously it's it's not a crappy mobile game so you know this adds a management aspect to the game which i really like do you buy a tier one weapon hoping you get another tier one to upgrade it to tier two to pair with your already tier two weapon now you're using at least two extra slots for your next round or do you just pack your inventory with the highest tier that you can buy from the shop and hope that you get lucky on your combinations? The combat, for the most part, feels very similar to other RBHs, but there's definitely some waves that feel a lot like bullet hells with so many enemies that fire projectiles. Even then, Brotato still gives you some options though because you can actually just kill the enemies before they can shoot, and problem solved. Overall, Brotato is a pretty fantastic game. The problem is I'm just not the biggest fan of the more traditional roguelike progression system that it has, where it gives you basically more and more challenge. I really like the Vampire Survivors progression where you get more challenge, but you also end up getting stronger. Brotato doesn't really give you that extra strength. It does, but it's not as straightforward as I would like it to be. So. A lot of other people should probably play this before some of the other stuff higher on the list, but for me personally, because of the more traditional roguelike elements, I've got it as low as I do. Coming in at number 6 is Nomad Survival. This is one that I actually had a really hard time ranking. Almost all of its core mechanics are kind of ripped straight from VS, but rather than just tweaking a couple things or adding a mechanic here or there, Nomad Survival took the everything including the kitchen sink approach. In addition to the normal VS mechanics, there's a companion system, with each companion able to do different things like attacking or freezing enemies or even gathering chests. The core gameplay loop has random events, but they're a lot more varied than what's in VS, and there are random spawns similar to VS's set ones of talking about the items on the map that you can pick up. This one makes a big difference because it pretty much completely eliminates the map planning strategy that you can do in VS. So I don't know that it's a positive change necessarily, but it's a big change nonetheless. All these new mechanics mesh pretty well together, and I think they help break up the monotony that can set in. Another interesting addition the devs have made is that everything is adjustable, from enemy health to spawn rate to damage done. 
It's non-traditional, but if you're willing to play around with it a bit, you can get a really unique experience that feels like a challenge made just perfectly for you. I also want to mention the sheer amount of settings in the game. Both because I think other games should implement similar settings, and because I think accessibility is something that's severely lacking amongst RBH games right now. While Nomad Survival doesn't have a colorblind mode, for example, they do let you change the music genre, enable and disable things like enemy outlines, and they let you transform their white weapon effects to black ones. It's not a perfect game by any means, but I think it's a worthwhile addition to the genre and I hope other games do something similar to the difficulty sliders. Before we continue talking about games, I wanted to take a minute to talk about accessibility a little bit more. I don't have delusions about smaller dev teams and solo devs competing with the likes of Sony when it comes to accessibility, but I think it's an important aspect of game design that anyone making a game should consider. And it's incredibly frustrating to see a genre with very simplistic gameplay not implement at least the basics when it comes to accessibility. I'm not asking for the moon and stars or anything, but there's a bare minimum that I would like to see all the games in this genre implement. Controller support. While most games have at least partial controller support, some of them have really wonky menuing, like they turn the joysticks into movable cursors and it just feels horrible. And that, why? Just implement it correctly, you know? Uh, button remapping. Being able to remap buttons is almost essential to making your game play one-handed, for example. And for pretty much every single one of these games, it should be pretty easy to configure to your liking, provided the ability to remap buttons is actually in it. And this one is especially frustrating to me because most of these games are using established engines like Unity or Godot, and those have built-in tools to enable button remapping. I, I promise, I looked it up. Sight aids. I think the bullet hell and reverse bullet hell genres both need to consider options that make it easier to see enemies and projectiles. While it's not as easy to add as some of the other items on this list, I'd really like to see enemy and projectile outlines as a feature. I'd also like to see at least one colorblind mode in these games. They don't have tens of thousands of assets to consider like a big RPG like maybe Skyrim would when making their palette swap, so I think at least one colorblind mode isn't too much to ask for. Auto firing. Most of these games already have auto fire, but there's a handful I played that rely on dual stick movement. It's definitely a bit of an ask, but I'd like to see those games implement an auto fire toggle at the very least, even if the default is still set to twin stick. That along with the key bindings would go a long way to enabling one handed gameplay like I said. And look, I'm not a game developer. I won't pretend these features are effortless to implement. But I think there's enough people in the world that would benefit from them that a serious effort should be made to implement at least some, if not all, of the accessibility features I outlined. And props to Nomad Survival for taking steps in the right direction. Alright, back to the list. At number 5 sits Hell Escape. Not to be confused with Hellscape, which I almost bought, but stopped myself because the trailer was so confusingly different from the demo that I played. This game seems like a clone of Vampire Survivors on its surface, again like some of these other ones, but I think it executes the formula really well and it does a good job of adding its own flair. They've added a dash, for example. It seems like a basic concept and something that a lot of other reverse bullet hells have added, but Hell Escape does a good job of making it useful. Every round there were genuinely times where I think I probably would have died without the dash, and I think if you're going to add a feature like this that you actually have to give it a purpose, and they've done a good job of that. Beyond the dash, there's a few things Hell Escape does differently, like chickens you can unlock that drop food when killed, or giving you weapon modifiers as unlocks that you can level up, like splitting arrows. This was an upgrade I picked up in one of my longer runs, and it turned my one projectile into two, reducing projectile size, and then further level ups gave me an extra projectile and reduced it. This is kind of in contrast to maybe how some of the normal level ups in Vampire Survivors works, for example. Most of the level twos gave you an extra projectile, but that's just part of the weapon evolution. Instead, Hell Escape makes you pick up a specific modifier. I think it adds some strategy to the game that might otherwise not be there. And there's also a unique chest system where the chests spawn randomly around the map rather than picking them up from spawns or after a timer or whatever. I just would find them while exploring. A big reason this is so high on the list is the overall progression system being so varied. It has the most things to upgrade out of any of the games I've checked out so far. 
And between that and the difficulty of the game itself, it's one worth checking out even if you haven't beaten VS yet. I want to go on another tangent before we move on. This time, what makes a good RBH beyond the criteria we've defined, right? We've defined the genre, what makes it an RBH, but what what is the line between good and bad, or just good and okay? I think the answer to this question is twofold. The first element is difficulty. While I was playing these games, I made note of any that I was able to win in my first run. I mean, yeah, I've probably gotten at least like 100 hours into the genre at this point, but with the progressive nature of these games, no matter how good I am, it should be very hard to finish a run on the first try. This genre needs a challenge to make winning feel good. It needs to feel like my skill and my build choices are why I won, not because the game was easy. A key aspect of difficulty for me is franticness. After playing a bunch of these, the best games were able to put me in situations where I had to sit and focus for at least a few minutes. No talking to myself, no note taking, and just pay attention to the game to survive. It's something that requires a delicate balancing of the difficulty, but when you win a run that had a segment or two with that extra bit of challenge, it really feels good. The second element I think is cohesive builds. This is something that I think can be a challenge to get right as a developer, but the games that do, it's really noticeable. What does a cohesive build look like? Well, counterintuitively, I think it starts by limiting your ability selection to begin with. The games that do this best limit you to around 6 weapons, and what this does is it forces you at a certain point in the run to upgrade your weapons, rather than just amassing new ones. Not only does it serve to push progression in each stage, but it gives an element of strategy to the runs. If you only have 6 picks, you're going to be a lot more careful with what you take. I think a cohesive build also needs different weapon types. This can come in a couple different forms, but I think the most basic is short and long range attacks, like melee and ranged, or just my arrows shoot very far and my shotgun does not kind of thing. Looking at vampire survivors, there's a good selection of close range weapons like garlic and the whip, as well as range weapons like, well, almost everything else. But to win a round of VS, especially with some of the difficulty modifiers, you need to have either stupidly powerful range weapons or a combination of short and long range. Now, there's some variation in this formula that some games on the list have adopted and it mainly comes in the way of status effects. Things like freezing weapons, slowing enemies, or electric ones dealing paralysis, or poison and fire weapons dealing dot. These additions can add a lot of variety and be the cherry on top of a good build. Maybe you can have a weaker primary weapon if you've been dealing chip damage with burn as the enemies walk up to you for example. It's implemented differently but this is kind of what Santa Water does in Vampire Survivors. It forces enemies to walk through some kind of damage wall in order to get closer to you. Not only do these mechanics add variety, but they also give the runs an element of strategy beyond number go up. And without cohesive builds, the gameplay can get pretty stale pretty quickly. At number 4, Soulstone Survivors feels like the next gen reverse bullet hell compared to pretty much everything else here. It's got a more modern feeling isometric art style, over the top animations that I feel like I would see in a MOBA or an MMO. And in this genre, that's something that makes it unique. Beyond the fresh coat of paint though, there's a surprising amount of newness to Soulstone that I didn't really expect to see when I started this video. Almost all the weapons are unique compared to other games in the genre. Obviously there's only so many ways to deal damage in an isometric game, but it feels like they've done a good job with it. And beyond the attacks feeling new, they've also done a really good job balancing the way that you target enemies. They actually have weapons that are aimed, weapons that shoot randomly, weapons that shoot close range, as well as AoE weapons. This is something that Vampire Survivors does decently as well, but it's not quite as varied as Soulstones is. It sounds like they might just be throwing everything into this game, and maybe they are, but if that's the case, then they've done a really good job with implementing and balancing everything out. Another unique element surrounding the weapons is the upgrade system. It's pretty standard as far as level up, pick a perk, repeat, but after all your weapon slots are filled, the game gives you an option between upgrading your existing weapons and passives, or getting new weapons, and at least in my experience, these are ones that you wouldn't find filling up your initial 5 or 6 slots. They're ones that you only see after you've already gotten full weapons. They've also added weapon types, much like Brotato has, where some upgrades affect all lightning attacks, for example, and you have three lightning weapons. It's a good way to add some depth and strategy to an otherwise simple game because as you're picking your perks, that's something you keep in mind, right? You have all melee weapons, or 
you have half poison and half fire weapons and that allows you to pick and choose upgrades as you go that are going to impact your weapons more. I would probably be here for too long if I tried to outline everything new or different that Soulstone Survivors does, but I think me saying that kind of outlines how much there is. It's probably the most unique game that I tried so far. In the number 3 spot is Nordic Ashes, the most recently released game I've tried, which makes it a little bit surprising that it's a number 3. Nordic Ashes is a Norse themed RBH and it has good and polished gameplay, pretty good art and soundtrack, and really all the components of a good RBH, but the secret sauce is in what isn't traditional. The first and most drastic departure from the norm is the leveling and skills. They aren't random like the other games on this list, rather each character you play has a different skill tree and that doesn't change. The randomness is still there though, don't worry, because as you level up there are various stats for each upgrade that can be different. For example, the level 3 bow might grant you an extra projectile one run, but faster firing the next. It's a lot more subtle than the random weapons in other games, but combined with the Hades-esque shop you can access after each boss fight, it still makes each run feel unique and distinct. I think a big part of why this game feels so good, despite being in early access and being so recently released, is that the devs took a kind of counterintuitive approach to early access, where they focused on finishing the characters and levels they have implemented 100% rather than the approach a lot of other early access games seem to have taken, which is to build the entire game 50-70% to 70 and then apply polish where needed. I don't think there's a wrong approach here, but as far as early access games go, Nordic Ashes makes a much better impression than most of the other games I've tried. And beyond their unique approach to early access, I think the other thing that, you know, kind of puts the cherry on top is that they've taken cues from Hades with things like the mid-level shop that you can access to buy weapons and upgrades. I think pulling from Hades if you're a roguelike or, you know, roguelike adjacent genre is really a no-brainer. It's, it's one of the best roguelikes that we've had come out recently. At number two is Spellbook Demon Slayers. This game is probably my favorite game on this list, but it has just a few too many bugs to be my number one. Nothing game breaking, but it's just frustrating and noticeably so. Like your stage not auto ending, or having to exit around twice randomly. Those are really my only complaints among the litany of praise that I'm about to give it. This game has a lot of vampire survivors at its core. I don't think it's a bandwagon release like some of the others on the list, but it's definitely not revolutionizing the genre. The first element to not being a bandwagon release are the weapons. They're going to feel really familiar, but they didn't have to clone anything from VS to get this familiarity. There's just, you know, only so many ways that you can shoot things. Every weapon I tried just felt solid, and their evolutions make meaningful changes to the weapon mechanics, which a lot of the games on this list just didn't do. They either didn't have evolutions or the weapons were very familiar, very similar to their previous incarnations. Then there's the synergy between weapons themselves. I don't know how the developer did it, but almost every weapon I tried feels like it meshes well with all of the other weapons. In my most recent run, for example, the first three weapons I picked up all fired in different directions, and then my fourth weapon was one that rotated around me. So I ended up shooting up, down, left, right, to the corners at a close enemy, and then I also had a rotating wall of death. I I know it's just because the weapons are designed that way, but having that kind of synergy and that that build up to basically just being the bullet hell, it, it felt really good. Another note about weapons is that, like I asked for earlier when I was talking about accessibility, this game actually lets you change the way you fire. From being directional to your movement, to being twin stick, to fully automatic. Even if you don't need the feature to play, having the option is great, and you can switch between them on the fly. Like if you wanted to DPS down a boss, you can switch to twin stick so you can target them specifically, and then you can switch back to automatic when you're done. It's such a great feeling system, and it's implemented like in the top corner of the game. It just feels like an effortless addition by the developer. They're like, oh yeah, of course. Yeah, of course you can shoot at whoever you want. Oh yeah, back to auto fire, go for it. Whatever you want. It, it just, it's not a big deal in the game, but I think having it there is a big deal. All right, moving on from the weapons, let's talk about the passives. While you don't need them to evolve your weapons like you do in VS, the passives in Spellbook, called Auras, are relatively unique in terms of effect, and they all have their own evolutions, just like the weapons do. 
You can even actually unlock extra evolutions through the overall progression system. One more level up mechanic is cursed abilities that carry negative side effects or drastically change the way something works. Like making your knockback actually pull people rather than push them or giving you extra shield and a bunch of revives but then setting your max HP to 1. They're a good way to give more variety to each run and make for even more unique builds. I don't want this section to end up being stupidly long so I'm going to cut myself off here but if the bugs get fixed this game will be at least tied with VS4 my favorite RBH. And the soundtrack is chef's kiss dude. Alright, number one. I know I just said Spellbook Demon Slayers is my favorite RBH, but the systems in Roguelike Genesia, and I'm saying Genesia, I have no idea how it's pronounced, but I'm, I'm thinking Genesis with an A at the end instead of an S, so Genesia. But the systems that Roguelike Genesia adds on top of the core gameplay are what give it the number one spot. There are actually two game modes in Rogue, an endless survival mode that feels a lot like all of the other games in the genre. I won't spend too much time on this mode because it's not the unique one, but all you really need to know is that it feels competent and provides a good challenge, and it had surprisingly well thought out leveling for, you know, being endless. The real reason Rogue is at the top of this list is because of Rog's mode. I would probably rename it personally to like Rog's Adventure, I don't know why, but that's what I originally wrote before I went back and looked at what it was. This is a mode where you move through a Slay the Spire-esque game board, routing and selecting different tiles like random encounters, battles, chests, or going to a shop. The system is an extremely fun way to frame RBH gameplay and it serves to add a lot of strategy, which is something that a lot of the games on this list are lacking and that VS executes so well. Combine this system with fun leveling mechanics and a slightly unique set of weapons and abilities, it separates itself from every other RBH. This game is still pretty deep in early access, so there's always a chance that it doesn't reach its full potential, but I think what's here already is worth checking out, and hey, there's even a demo, so no risk involved other than, you know, maybe the minor addiction. Well, that's it. It took me weeks, but that's the top 9 list of reverse bullet hells as of January 2023. Along the way, I've defined a genre and called out some changes that I think need to be made. If you're a fan of the RBH genre, any of the games on this list are worth checking out, and if you're more on the fence, I think at least the top four stand on their own merits. After playing some of these games like Rogue Genesia and Nordic Ashes, I'm really excited to see where the genre progresses, and even for other games to maybe take some cues from this genre. Like maybe we'll see a Hades type game with auto firing weapons at some point. Hell, I'd love to see Hades with a 30 minute survival stage, you know? My other takeaway from making this video is just how good Vampire Survivors actually is. I think it lacks some of the longevity that other roguelikes like Hades, Slay the Spire, or Darkest Dungeon have, but the gameplay loop is just so damn good it's pretty easy to look past. And the strategy element that comes from having to have a specific passive to evolve your weapon is just something that no other game has managed to match yet. Anyways, thanks for hanging out with me today. I hope you enjoyed the video. I've been Alaskan Beard. I make video game content and occasionally stream on Twitch. If you like what you watched today, give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. And if you want more content, follow me on Twitter or check out my Twitch streams.